Hi everyone, Christy Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about love stories. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day and so I thought it was an appropriate time to discuss the love stories in your family tree um, that, that led to you. Now, when we start talking historically, sometimes it's really difficult to look at the records and to determine if there really is a love story. But there were a couple of things that happened in the last couple of weeks that got me thinking about this topic, and so I just wanted to share a few of them with you. Um, First of all, one of my colleagues shared a record in a presentation she gave at Roots Tech last week. It was a a family uh, where the father was a mariner. He was the captain of his own ship. Uh, He resided in England, met and married a girl there in England. Then, um, as you look at the birthplaces of each of the children, they had children born in the West Indies, a child born in Calcutta, India, a child, another child born back in the West Indies. And what you're seeing is these children being born all over the world, which says that that wife was traveling with her husband um, as he um, captained his own ship around the world. And it just kind of sparked this idea for me that that in sometimes in the records you can actually see the love stories. You can actually see that these people wanted to be together. Um, unlike many captains, he didn't leave her behind in England and just sail into port every couple of years to see her. And I just thought that that was a really touching thing. Um, then the other thing that happened is I reread an article, and I'll share that with you here in just a minute, from the New York Times um, about strong family narratives. And so I started thinking about the love stories in my own family tree. So let me just um, share with you a couple of those just so that you get a flavor for what it is that I'm talking about. So these are some of my family members. Up here in the corner, these are my great-great-grandparents, Benjamin Franklin Heaps and Anne Eva Dittmore. And I know a little bit about their love story. This is, as far as we can tell, this is their wedding photo. And they uh, raised a large family of children in Pleasant Grove, Utah, which just happens to be where I live now, which is really interesting because I was not raised here. My parents were not raised here. My grandparents were not raised here. Um, But my great grandparents were born here where I happen to live now. This is their daughter, Mary, Mary Heaps, um, and she married my, my great-grandpa, Victor. I knew him. He um, actually was still living when I was born, and I have some memories of him as a child. And the love story between these two is just epic. Um, he adored her, and she adored him. And to listen to my grandmother talk about the love between her parents has always been really inspiring to me to know um, he just he doted on her and took care of her when she was ill and um, he hated uh, he hated food that was hot or cold he liked all of his food at room temperature and so she would make meals and then just let his food sit until it till it reached room temperature just little things like that where um, you start to see these stories or these narratives about how people cared for each other um, and the little things that show that there was love in that relationship um, not that it was an obligation or or whatever and so these are my these are my grand my great grandparents, and then this is their daughter, my grandmother, um, Doris, and my grandfather Fred. And the love story between these two, if the love story between these two is epic, I don't think a word has been invented yet um, for the love story between my grandparents. My grandmother talks about how um, she was working at McDonnell Douglas, and my grandfather was an engineer uh, he, he was a draft engineer and he would check out plans and part of her job was to refile those plans and it used to drive her crazy because she'd always see these plans from this from this man named Cowan coming through and she just had to refile so many of them and she thought why does this one guy check out so much stuff and she had no clue who he was at the time but she was really frustrated with him well uh, at the same time she happened to catch the eye of this cute man in, in and around the office, and um, she thought he was attractive, and she mentioned that to her friend, and little did she know that it was the same man who she spent most days you know, cursing out because she was so frustrated with the amount of work that he gave her. And so she tells that story about how they met um, at work and how he then you know, courted her with, with Cokes. He used to bring her Cokes to her desk and um, you know, try to get her to go out with him. And that she finally gave in, and and then she tells the story of their courtship and and their marriage, and 
to this day, she will talk about him. One of my favorite memories of them as a couple, uh, my grandfather had kind of a gruff demeanor super, super jelly soft in the middle, but kind of a gruff demeanor that if you didn't know him came across a little intimidating. And his nickname for my grandmother was Sweetheart. And that's what he called her all the time. Only he didn't say it like that. He used to kind of bellow it and it came out sounding like Sweetheart. And as grandchildren, we just thought that was the funniest thing that he called our grandmother a sweater. We couldn't understand what he was saying. And it wasn't until we were a little bit older that we realized he was calling her sweetheart. But it just always came out sweater. Um, and, uh, and, and I just love that. I love that memory. It's also really touching to me when I go visit my brother and his wife. And that's what my brother now calls his wife. Because to him, sorry, I'm getting really choked up about this, but... To him, that is love. Um, and that's the relationship that we grew up watching. So uh, love stories obviously have the potential to really move us, but they also have the potential to bind generations of our family together. This then is my parents, their son, my dad, and my mom on their wedding day. And again, um, just this amazing love story. My parents um, just celebrated their 43rd wedding anniversary and they are loving being empty nesters and grandparents and, uh, and they just adore each other. And none of these relationships are perfect. Uh, none of these relationships um, are without heartache or trial or frustration or um, arguments or whatever. None of these relationships is perfect, but there is love involved. And it has been really um, a great thing for us to have this, this narrative, um, this strong narrative of love stories in our family. It has really bound us together. And so that's what I just want to talk about uh, today. I know that was a really long introduction, but this is the article that uh, has been circulated a lot in the genealogy community, but it just it came across my desk again a couple of weeks ago, and I've been thinking a lot about it. Um, it there's a lot of areas of family history that it pertains to, but I want to talk about it in light of this perspective. So the article is from the New York Times. It's called The Stories That Bind Us. Bruce Filer is the author. It was uh, published on the 15th of March, 2013. You should be able to Google any of that information and pull the complete article up. And I encourage you to go read it because it really is a great article. But I just pulled a few quotes out of the article that I felt were particularly pertinent to family history and to our discussions about family history. One is um, the, the author writes, the single most important thing you can do for your family is to develop a strong family narrative. Um, he actually got that information from an Emory University study. Um, there was a Dr. Duke and his wife, who was a psychologist, who did this study on families and discovered that families that have a strong family narrative are able to cope better with the um, emotional turmoil that life brings. And a lot more to the story. Like I said, I encourage you to go read that article. But um, the the psychologist, uh, this was her kind of summary of the event, of the study that they did. She said, children who know a lot about their families tend to do better when they face challenges. And so while I'm talking about love stories in particular, it doesn't matter what the stories are. Um, it could be stories of triumph. It could be stories of tragedy. It could be stories of um, overcoming hard hard things and succeeding. It could be attempting to overcome hard things and failing. It doesn't matter. It's just that that narrative that they that children and in particular teenagers have these stories that they can rely on. And there are now studies, and this is uh, just one of about three different studies that I've read where um, that has been proven out, that if they know these stories, it can help them. And so that's, that's my message today. Um, I'm just going to give you some tips for how to get this information um, out of your family members, how to get it into the lives of your family. Um, the first one is write down your own love stories. And I made that plural on purpose. Um, some of us have more than one love story, right? Uh, some of us have been married multiple times. Some of us have um, multiple children. Uh, and I think about the love story that comes out between a parent and a child. Have you somewhere written down the feelings that you had the day that your child was born or the feelings that you had 
about the day that your child graduated from high school or got married or did something successful in their career. Uh, And it's not just a matter of telling those stories, but recording those stories. Can you imagine if you had recorded stories from your ancestors, if they had written down information about about how they met and how they fell in love, if they had written down stories about the day that their children were born, we would we every one of us I think would just love to have that. And so we need to be the kind of ancestors that we wish we had. So write down your love stories. You can do it in a blog. You can do it in a journal or a diary. You can just do it in a notebook. Um, I have one friend who types up letters to his children on the first Sunday of every month. He, he writes an email and he sends it out to all his kids. And each email is just a story from the life of their family. Something about him and his wife, something about him and the children, some kind of memory. And the the first Sunday of every month, he just sends that email out to all of his grown children. Um, uh, You know, his children are all grown and have families of their own, but he felt that that was the way he could do it. So however you choose to do it, just get them written down. I think that that's really important. Also, interview any living family members you have about their love stories. Uh, my grandmother, the one whose picture I just showed you, she is still living. Uh, she's 91 years old, and I get to go see her again in a week and a half, and I'm so excited to do that. She, I love visiting with her, and uh, and I want to hear more about that story. I always have more questions to ask, and sometimes I, hear the, I'll, I will hear the same story over and over and over again. But sometimes uh, new little details come out depending on how I ask those questions or what I have learned about the time and the place that she lived. Uh, I, get, I get better at asking questions. And as I get better at asking questions, she gets, um, she gets better at sharing details of the story that I might have missed before. So interview those living family members, grandparents, parents, um, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, Maybe even your children, right? If you have grown children uh, who have children of their own, maybe interview each of your children about their love stories and record those in a book for your grandchildren so that they know you know, where they come from. And I'm going to say this as delicately as I can, but even if some of those relationships did not end well, uh, I know a lot of families end um, sometimes um, tragically and messy and, and with hurt feelings and divorce and all, you know, under all sorts of dis- different circumstances. But get them to see if you can get them to a place where they can remember um, some of just the, the information about that relationship. When and where did they meet? Uh, what were the circumstances? What do they remember about the first time they met that person? Um, you know, where were they? What were they doing? What was going on in their life? Then uh, how long did they date? You know, what was their courtship like? What did they, what kinds of things did they do as a couple? Um, what were some of their favorite activities? You know, was there a favorite hangout spot? Um, you know, were they, did they talk a lot during their courtship? Did they go dancing a lot? Did they just do dinners and movies all the time? You know, what kinds of activities? And of course, that's going to be different for every couple. And it's going to be different generationally as well, uh, which makes that kind of a fun question to ask and to compare across relationships. Um, And then when did when did they know they were in love? Was there a moment or an event or you know, was it something quiet that just happened over time that they just realized one day? Or did they know right off the bat? <laughs> you know, just whatever, right? These are the kinds of questions you can ask, even for relationships that have ended. And if people are willing to talk about them, again, record these stories. They make for a strong family narrative, especially for children. Um, and in particular, in situations of divorce, where the children's only memory may be of the messy, ugly way that it ended, um, or even some of the trauma that they still deal with, um, with parents sometimes who struggle to co-parent even after divorce. Um, But to give them a story of the fact that at one point, their parents did love each other. And at one point, um, that was a real relationship that um, that resulted in them. And so there's some, some, like I said, I tried to be a little sensitive to that because I know everybody's circumstance is different. But again, we're looking to a strong family narrative to help those children be able to cope with the things that happen in their own lives. And those strong family narratives need to include 
all of the all of the information, the good times and the bad times, the hard things as well as the overcoming of challenges, all of that. Love stories is just one perspective or one aspect of how you can do that. And so here's just, this is just my little formula for how you ask those questions, how you talk to those family members. And like I said, you determine how you're going to record that, but record it. Make sure those stories get written down. Um, try to make sure those stories get told. There's one more little just um, thing I want to share about my family, uh, and it's something that has carried on into another generation now. So my parents, we are a family that when we gather around the dinner table, um, we say grace over the meal. And when we pray, um, as soon as the prayer is finished, before anybody starts eating, um, we say amen. And then my parents, my whole life, who sit next to each other at the dinner table. They don't sit at bookends at either end. Um, when amen is said, they lean over to each other and they kiss each other. And so my whole life, I grew up seeing that. Um, and and sometimes, you know, they, they always did it, even when they weren't so happy with each other. And it's interesting now to watch my siblings um, that are married, that they have carried on that tradition in their own homes. And my, my nieces and nephews, my parents' grandchildren, are now seeing that example, um, that example of physical affection in their home and in their family, um, and connecting that with the times when the family is all together, particularly in this case around the dinner table. So uh, that is creating a strong family narrative. And I have actually written that down. I've written down that, that that's what my parents did my whole life. It's just, a, it's just two short paragraphs. I wrote down that that's what's happened my whole life with my parents and that now I'm seeing my siblings do this and, and what effect I see that that has on their children. I've recorded that because, um, you know, 20, 40, 60 years from now, when another generation starts doing this, I want them to know where that started. And I want them to know, again, that there is this, this pattern that weaves us all together as a family. For me, that is one of the reasons why I do family history. It's not just to see how far back in history I can go, as much as I love that. It's not just to be able to um, discover people in my family who might have participated in great events in history, uh, you know, the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, the um, Industrial Revolution, um, you know, the suffragette movement, whatever. I love doing that too. I love seeing people in my family and, and how those events affected them and how they helped affect those events. I love that. Um, I love mostly everything about family history, but this is an aspect of family history that I also so love and that I just wanted to share with you today um, as my Valentine's gift to you um, that we need to focus more on the stories of our lives and the fact that we um, need to be a little bit better at being the kind of ancestors we wish we had, that we need to record our own stories and whatever stories we have of those in our recent past memory um, as well as the stories that are occurring in our family history right now. That's all I have for you today. It was a brief, um, brief show today, but I hope that that was helpful and that it sparked some ideas for you and that you will go and record your family stories. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.